everyone comes into the contact with the law. Basically there are three types of law that everyone has something to do with. First is criminal law, second is the law of torts, and finally is contract law. Criminal law is really about things that the state imposes on us that we all have to comply with. Tort law is similar, although it's not really the state, it is the courts saying that there are some fundamental obligations that everybody has to comply with. The law of negligence is a good example of this. And you can see that there's some overlap between criminal law and negligence. If you have an accident with your car, you might be prosecuted for breaching traffic regulations, but you also might be uh, sued in negligence for property damage. The third area is completely different. That is contract law where you assume obligations to somebody else, quite voluntarily and willingly. Today, let's talk about contract law. My name's Ross Dillon, I'm a consultant with Queen City Law, and I'm a civil litigator. In other words, when things go bad, I represent you in court. Contract law, as I've said, is a different type of law because voluntarily assume obligations to another person or a group of people. A good example of contract law that most people will be familiar with is employment law where you barter effectively your labour for wages. And that is a good area to raise the first caveat about contract law because it's not completely up to the parties. There are often circumstances where there is a statutory overlay. Employment Relations Act, Holidays Act, there's a whole lot of statutes that impact on what parties can agree in terms of the exchange of labour for wages. So what is a contract? I'll propose a definition that goes like this. A contract is an agreement between at least two competent parties who agree to perform specified obligations for the other or others and intend to be bound by such agreement. Now that has to be unpacked a bit, so let's use an example. Two children are in the school playground having lunch. One has a large drink and the other has two donuts. The one with the drink offers to share his drink in exchange for a donut. The other agrees. Now do we have a contract? Well, we have an agreement between two parties. We have an exchange of obligations, sense of a drink for a donut, and they both intend that this will be their deal. So it looks like one, but let's unpack it further. I used the concept of, or the example of children, intentionally because they're going to be under 18. I've already warned about contractual overlays, and in fact we have a Contract and Commercial Law Act 2017 which deals with agreements with people who are under 18 years of age. This impacts particularly in the area of competence. Are the people you are dealing with competent to consent to a contractual arrangement? Obviously children have to be protected in those sort of circumstances and there are plenty of other types of circumstances where a contract might not be enforceable because of the competence of the contracting parties. Again, and another aspect of this is whether they intend to enter into legally enforceable obligations. That might be a bit of a stretch in the context of an arrangement made in the playground. So whether or not we have a contract has a number of legal tests that have to be met. Let's start right at the beginning with the concepts of offer and acceptance. An offer is the communication of a willingness to be bound to certain terms without further negotiations. Acceptance is the communication of the acceptance of that offer. Now, there are things that might look like an offer that aren't an offer. For instance, the courts have accepted that a shop window display with, say, a dress and a price is not in itself an offer. It's an invitation. 
So you have to go into the store and say, yes, I'm willing to buy that dress at that price, and the retailer will then sell it to you, and that's their acceptance of your offer. Another indication of that type of concept is an, a request for the acceptance of tenders. When a, a large building is going to be built, the developer will often ask for tenders. That's not an offer. He's asking people, in fact, to make offers, which are the tender documents. And then when that tender is accepted, that's when the contract is formed. So there can be multiple stages, not simply offer and acceptance. Another good example is an auction, where every bid at an auction is an offer, and the fall of the hammer is the acceptance. Acceptance also has to be communicated. It's no good having received an offer thinking, yes, I'll accept that and not doing anything about it. Obviously, the other side needs to know that you've accepted the offer. And that can lead to other sorts of problems. For instance, if your acceptance is by an email to the other side and they don't receive the email, what happens then? As it happens, there are a number of rules around those types of circumstances. Again, we can go to the Contracts and Commercial Law Act and find an answer to those types of problems. If we've got offer and acceptance, the next thing we need to make sure we've got is what is called consideration, which is a rather odd word, but basically means there is an exchange in value. Uh, buying goods at a shop is a simple example. You get the goods, you pay the money. You've paid something, you have received something. You have consideration. The playground example, the drink for the donor. Another example of both sides giving something in exchange for what they receive. There can be all sorts of problems with the concept of consideration. For instance, in our play playground example, if one child had offered to share his drink, the other child had accepted that and drank it, and then the child with the drink said, oh, how about you give me one of your donuts? You're not going to get a contract because the consideration has already passed. When the child accepted the drink, it came without any obligation. And to reverse that out in time, it's not something that the courts will accept. Having said that, as with everything in contract law, there are some exceptions, but we don't need to go to them today. Just be aware that consideration generally is forward-looking. Those obligations have to be performed sometime in the future, even if it's just more or less instantly. Also dealt with the question of intent to create legal obligations. This is not a subjective issue. You can't say later oh, I didn't really intend to be bound by that. The court will take the view that if a reasonable person in the context of which any communications took place could have been expected to be creating legal obligations, then the court will find that a contract was in place and that the intent to create legal obligations did exist. It is an objective test. Another issue is contractual certainty. With our playground example, it's fairly simple. You get a drink and you get a donut. Uh, but you have to make sure that you've got all of the who, what, where, when, and how issues addressed in your contract. Otherwise, you might find that there's a big piece missing and you haven't actually got a contract. The courts do deal with implied terms though, so even if it's not expressed, there might be a context in which the court can say, although we can't see anything here in the agreement itself, it's implicit in this arrangement that certain other terms would attach to the arrangement. So you can have the express things that you specifically agreed to, but there are also the opportunity to have implied terms which might fill in a few of the gaps. And then there is the issue of privity of contract, another great legal term, but just means really who are the parties to the agreement. In our playground example, if one of the children said, if you give a donut to my sister, I will give you a drink. You can see that the parties to the contract, the one that has the drink and the one that has the two donuts, are providing a benefit to somebody else 
and can that somebody else enforce the arrangement? Now again, the Contract and Commercial Law Act provides an answer to a lot of those circumstances, but it really takes you into the question of agency law where one party is contracting on behalf of others, and that's much too big a subject to deal with today. So, whether or not you have a contract depends on offer, acceptance, communication of acceptance, consideration, intent to create legal obligations, certainty and privity, and always bearing in mind that there could be a statutory overlay in relation to the particular things you are dealing with. If you have questions or concerns about whether or not you have a contract and what its nature and extent might be, well, you know where to find us. Thanks.